Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Pokemon Let's Go Eevee are happening. Hey everyone, I'm Pokeversity and we got a whole load of news today regarding Pokemon for the Switch, but today what I actually want to focus on is the trailer and I want to break down everything that we were shown. So, shall we get started? First and foremost, this is very clearly a yellow version remake, just with two versions, one for Pikachu, one for Eevee. There's not really a lot to say on that, other than the fact that that's important to bear in mind as we go on. We start the video with a Pikachu in the real world. There's not really too much to see here, but it does kind of link the connection between Go and the new games, which we'll see later. Next, we move on to a scene where the male trainer obtains a Pikachu in a room that I can only assume is Professor Oak's lab. Next, we see flashes of Pallet Town, a route that appears to be Route 1, and Future City. What's interesting to note is in both of these shots, Pikachu is riding on your back the whole time. So we talked about in our build up to this announcement video that I absolutely love the following Pokemon mechanic from Heart Gold and Soul Silver, and this is awesome to see come back. And maybe we might see later that there might be something else to do with that. Additionally, we can see that where the ledges are on Route 1 and in Fuchsia City, the ground is properly raised up. This is a feeling that the recent games just haven't managed to capture as perfectly as this game does, and it looks awesome. Next we move on to the female trainer, presumably obtaining her Eevee, also in Professor Oak's lab. Then we move on to a shot with Eevee on her head, just like Pikachu was on the male trainer's shoulder, in Pewter City, and then to Viridian Forest, and then to the docks in Vermilion City, presumably after visiting the SSN. Next we get a brief look at Professor Oak on Route 1, surrounded by Pidgey, which fly off away from him, and then we cut to him in his lab. On the wall in this shot there is some writing on the blackboards and post-its that unfortunately I can't read, uh, but the board does appear to have two Rattata on it, and one of them is either holding a berry or is very, very fat for some reason. I'm not really sure what's going on with that, but they're silhouettes and I'm sure there's not really anything hidden there. Next we see a few shots of the male trainer interacting with Pikachu. There's not really a lot to digest here other than to show off how amazing and expressive the graphics look. And this is an awesome time for me to mention that these games look spectacular. They really are an upgrade on anything that we've seen on the 3DS and they just look wonderful. Next we see the player removing one Joy-Con and playing with just that alone. This showcases a brand new feature that this game can be enjoyed with just one Joy-Con. Next we see the trainer on the south part of Route 2, where we see for the first time Pokemon in the overworld. In the grass here we see a Pidgey, a Rattata and a Weedle, indicating that the Pokemon that we encounter in each area are likely to be the same as in the original games, as Pidgey, Rattata and Weedle were also available on the south part of Route 2 in yellow. We then see the trainer enter a battle with Pidgey, and this is where one of the most noticeable differences can be seen. Instead of sending a Pokemon out, the trainer is greeted with a Pokemon Go style battle interface where they may get ready to throw a Pokeball, meaning that up until this point the motion controls are locked. They may also use items, probably something like raspberries or change balls. They may select help, which we're not really sure what that means. It may be a tutorial type thing or it may have some other kind of benefit. Uh, or they may run away. I would expect that when running away the Pokemon disappears from the overworld map or the player is placed a distance away from the Pokemon. It can also be seen here that the ball counter returns from Pokemon Go. The player then successfully throws a ball and catches the Pidgey. At first glance it may seem like there's little skill to the throw mechanic here but as can be seen, the player throws the ball and is not greeted by a nice, great or excellent indicating that it's not only possible to be off centre with your shots, but potentially you could miss altogether as well, so there is some skill in the catch mechanic here. The next couple of shots show trainers using the switch in its various modes and catching a variety of Pokemon, including Mankey, Bellsprout and Staryu, with more accuracy than was seen in the first one, getting nice and great catches. Next we move on to another brand new feature in the games, Co-op. Here we see a second player join the game by shaking the second Joy-Con. 
It appears that the co-op partner will always be a character of opposite gender to that of your player. As we do not see any kind of character selection here, this is the only assumption that can be made. It's possible that this was just for the build showed in the demo, but I find that unlikely. It's most likely that you just play the other character. Also, this new trainer does not have a Pokemon on their shoulder, so it's unlikely that players will be able to bring their own teams in to play co-op. It's most likely that you're sharing the same team roster and you're just kind of going on this adventure together. Next, we see the two players heading into Mount Moon, which has had a little bit of an entrance redesign. The next shot we see is inside of Mount Moon, where we see the Pokemon in the overworld again. Here, we can see two Geodude, two Clefairy, and a Paris. Now, interestingly, there's a Zubat missing here, but as the trainer moves towards the top of the screen, we see how spawning works, where a Zubat poofs into existence from an empty floor tile. The trainers then enter a battle with a wild Clefairy. Here we see more of the battle interface. In the top right corner of the screen, we see some stats about Clefairy. Here we see its gender, male, and we see that it's level 10, and that it has a CP of 60. This brings up a couple of points. First of all, that level 10 is within the level range that Clefairy would usually be caught in Mount Moon, indicating the fact that the level curve may be consistent with the old games. The other interesting fact here is that Clefairy has CP. It's possible that along with the simplified wild Pokemon encounters that this game brings, the simplified stat system from Pokemon Go may also be present here. Notably, we see that Trainer 2 has the option to use items and ready themselves to throw, but they do not have the help or the runaway options that Trainer 1 has. We then see a pair of trainers simultaneously throw balls at Clefairy, both landing excellent throws and catching the Pokemon. The balls then combine into one. It feels like the animation jumps a little here. I assume that we get the usual ball wiggle before confirming capture animation. Uh, and it's unknown at this point if throwing the two Pokeballs actually uses two Pokeballs or not, or if there's any kind of benefit to doing so. Uh, it's unknown at this point in time, but it will be interesting to see what comes from this. Next, we see two different trainers on what appears to be Nugget Bridge. Here, they're challenged by Bugcatcher Kale, and we see that the primary trainer has its Pikachu on his shoulder as he enters the battle. Moving into the battle, we see an interface we are more familiar with. The trainer has a choice of three moves for Pikachu, with a clear space for a fourth. Strangely though, by this stage in Generation 7, Pikachu should have learned way more than four moves, so it's possible that the moveset of each Pokemon could be simplified down. It doesn't look like that might be the case, as I'll get to in a minute, but possibly. Alternatively, this could just be because of the build of the game shown in this trailer, but... I'm not really sure why they'd show something like that. We see that since we're in co-op, the other player has a Bulbasaur sent out. Once again, I can assume that this Bulbasaur is just a second Pokemon from Trainer 1's team that Trainer 2 gets to control. I don't think you're going to be able to bring your own Pokemon team over into co-op, unfortunately. Bulbasaur is also level 18 here. I can only assume that it's unevolved because the Pokemon company can get more brand recognition from Bulbasaur than Ivysaur. I would think that evolution's probably going to act the same in these games, but that's just speculation on my part. We see that Bugcatcher Kale has only one Pokemon, his level 9 Venonat. Now, in Generation 3, Bugcatcher Kale had four Pokemon. He had a Caterpie, a Weedle, a Kakuna, and a Metapod, all at level 10. So even though he only has a Venonat here, the level curve may still be similar since his Venonat is level 9, and that's still in consistency with kind of the level of trainers that you were fighting at this stage of the game. Next, we see Bulbasaur preparing to attack, and we can see his moveset. Here we see Poison Powder, Sleep Powder, Leech Seed, and Takedown. Not really the moveset that I would choose for a Bulbasaur, but normally Bulbasaur would learn takedown at level 15 in the games, so this is consistent with the Gen 7 moveset by levelling. Also, both the attacks of Pikachu and Bulbasaur do have the correct amount of PP for their level, and the HP does seem to be consistent with the HP that they should both have at level 18. That's really making this feel like it is just a core RPG, just the wild Pokemon interface has changed. Again, we don't know all the stuff that's going on with the stats behind the scenes, so reserve judgment for that, but so far the only real difference I've seen is the Pokemon Go style wild Pokemon encounters. 
We see the rest of the battle play out in the normal turn-based way that we'd come to expect from a normal main series Pokemon RPG, which this apparently is, so just saying. The trailer then moves on to show us a new peripheral available with this game, the Pokeball Plus. This functions like a Joy-Con, with a thumbstick where the button of the Pokeball should be, and there's a button on top which I presume acts like an A button. We see the player moving around cycling road with this device, and here in the tall grass we can see a Pidgey and a Psyduck. If we look up into the top corner we can see a Raticate, the first Pokemon in the overworld to be outside of the tall grass other than in caves. The trainer then enters battle with a wild Psyduck and catches it in the same way that we saw before with the Joy-Con. The cool thing here is, you can throw a Pokeball. It can also be seen that the Pokeball flashes on the screen, as does the one that you're holding, so they'll flash in unison, which is a small little detail that they didn't have to do, but it's super cool that it works at the same time. We then cut out, panned back, to a kid in his room, and on the screen it looks like he's browsing his Switch menu. This might be a Pokedex menu, or it may just be the menu from your party screen. Here we see Psyduck's Pokedex entry, which is almost verbatim with the Pokemon Yellow Pokedex entry for Psyduck. We also see this Psyduck's weight and height displayed on the left hand side, while there's a record of catches and weight and height over on the right hand side for other Psyduck caught. This indicates that you might have a reason to catch multiple of the same species of Pokemon. Up at the top here with Psyduck it says three caught. Now I don't know about you guys, but generally when I'm playing a Pokemon game, I catch one. I don't catch three Psyduck. So there must be a reason for this, some kind of in-game benefit. I'm hoping that it's not to do with evolution. I'm hoping that the candy system isn't really in this game, but there's clearly some kind of benefit going on here. So just bear that in mind. We then see the same screens for Mankey and Poliwag, and it should be noted that their Pokedex entries here are almost exactly the same as they were in yellow, so that indicates to me that their Pokedex entries, for what they're worth, are going to be the Pokemon yellow ones. We then see a player selecting from a menu to take a Pokemon on a stroll with them. So here we're seeing that the peripheral allows you to bring a Pokemon out into the real world with you. Also on this menu we see that there's an option to save your progress and return to your adventure. This is only a small tweak but something that fans may notice. The save game feature won't be on the same menu that you access your party Pokemon and items from, so that's a little bit different. The player decides to take Pikachu for a stroll and her Pokeball Plus lights up and Pikachu's voice emanates from a speaker inside of the peripheral. This shows that Pokemon in the Pokeball can also be interacted with by moving the ball around. If you shake it or if you roll it around it may have different interactions with the Pokemon. Not sure how this might impact in-game, maybe it boosts the friendship stat or something like that, but it's cool nonetheless. Next we see how Pokemon may be transferred from Pokemon Go to a place called the Go Park, which then appears in the Switch version of the game. The trainer here catches a Dratini in Pokemon Go and sends it to his Switch game. Here in the background we can see a Charizard, two Nidoqueens, a Venomoth, a Clefairy, a Bulbasaur, a Zapdos, and the tail of an Onix. There's also some kind of quadrupedal Pokemon at the back, but it's hard to tell exactly what it might be. Also in the foreground there's some kind of antenna, this might be the head of an Alakazam, or a Kadabra, or an Abra. We then see that gifts can be sent to Pokemon Go from the Switch title, although we do not see what can be sent and how, or anything to do with this. We do see this again later though, so to be continued. We then see a player catching a Magmar in a house that looks like the Cinnabar Mansion, and we also see a player doing a double battle using Pikachu and a Meowth aboard the deck of the SSN, although the Pokemon they're fighting can't be made out here. We also see that the player can ride various Pokemon. We see an Onix being ridden by the player, note that Eevee is still on your head while this is the case, we then see the male trainer riding a Lapras with Pikachu still on his shoulder. And we then see the male trainer flying on a Charizard over what appears to be Route 17 or the Cycling Road. We see the two trainers, each being followed by a Nido Queen and a Nido King in one of the underground pathways. Based on the angle, this is most likely the one that links Cerulean City and Vermilion City. Both trainers are then being followed by an Electrode and a Gengar on Route 14. Now, if you look here, 
you'll see that the cut bushes are also going to make a return. Although this may not necessarily indicate that HMs are coming back, but it is important to note. One more Pokemon Go shot is seen of a Moltres of arriving in the Poke Park. Nothing really here. We then see various catching attempts at an Abra, a Snorlax, and a Haunter. The Haunter is clearly being captured in the Lavender Tower. It can also be seen that both the Snorlax and the Haunter have had Ultra Balls thrown at them, which is the first time that we've seen an alternative kind of ball scene in these games. We then move on to the fact that motion controls can be used to pet Pikachu and presumably Eevee, and maybe also some of your other Pokemon, who knows. We then move on to the fact that both Pikachu and Eevee can be customised with various costumes. We then see that the changes that you make to Pikachu and Eevee will follow them into battle and presumably into the overworld. We see a male trainer fighting a member of Team Rocket with his customised Pikachu, and then we see a female trainer fighting a fisherman on the SSN with her customised Eevee. In the next couple of shots we see Dragonite, Blastoise, Arbok and Cloyster performing moves in battle before we see a Magikarp jumping into outer space. Maybe this is a minigame. Then finally we see a Golem fighting a Snorlax and Massive Explosion which looks pretty cool in the new engine. Next the trailer cuts away to the player's encounter with Mewtwo in the Cerulean Cave. This cutscene looks really good, really nice in this resolution. It's just a very pretty scene to behold. We then see the male trainer just south of Cerulean City, which you can tell by noticing this cut bush just up here, and we see the female trainer on the same patch of cycling road where the male trainer was seen riding Charizard before, and in this shot we see that items in the overworld will still return as Pokeballs. The final shot of the trailer shows us the same screen that we saw when sending gifts to Pokemon Go, stating that we will meet a special Pokemon in this way. What this Pokemon is remains a mystery for now, but who knows, maybe this will be the first Gen 8 Pokemon. That's everything that the trailer has to show. Let me know down below if this gets you excited. Try and keep it positive, guys. And let me know if this video's been good, if I've missed anything really obvious or anything like that. Thank you all very much for watching. If you like this video then please be sure to hit that thumbs up button. If you want to see more from me then please subscribe and ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all my latest videos. I may very well do a my thoughts on Pokemon Let's Go at a later date so please be sure to let me know if you want to see that. Once again guys I'm Pokeversity and thank you very much for watching.